Welcome to the Muscle Expert Podcast with Ben Pakulski, one of the world's top professional bodybuilders, an expert on human performance and mindset mastery. Ben dives deep to deliver the strategies of the top experts to upgrade your body, mind, muscle, strength, performance, biochemistry, and how to become the upgraded modern man. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Muscle Expert Podcast. I'm your host, Ben Pakulski, and today we're diving deeper and deeper into our health. So we all want to live our greatest life in a body that we love, ultimately, in our greatest body. And sometimes it feels like we're fighting an uphill battle, uh, especially with the things that are existing in nature that sometimes we're not even aware of. And sometimes there's a little bit of ambiguity or uncertainty around, is this actually causing harm? I'm not really sure. And today we're going to discuss glyphosate. So the reason this topic comes up and I'm smiling is because I made a post a few weeks back on social media posting about the recent um, Monsanto lawsuit result. And um, Monsanto, which is now owned by Bayer, was obligated to pay this gentleman as a result of a jury's decision to convict. And uh, so I posted this saying, you know, hey, we got to do something to get this out of our soil. We got to get this out of our food supply. We get this out of our air and our water. And a lot of people were like, yeah, great, that sounds awesome. And then I got some really serious slack from a very few particular people who said there's absolutely no data to prove that glyphosate has anything wrong with it whatsoever. It has no negative health implications. It has, it's completely dormant in human beings. So being the uh, questioner that I am or the, the inquisitive human being that I am, I went out to find the top researchers and the top authorities I could find. And today's guest, Dr. Stephanie Seneff from MIT, is committed to finding the answers around glyphosate and how it works and whether or not it's actually killing us the way that some people claim it is. Um, Dr. Seneff and I get really deep into some of the current research. Uh, this is a very, very interesting topic for me, right? So some of the claims around glyphosate are that it's completely destroying your microbiome. And I think that we know is definitive because um, glyphosate was actually gone on patent as an antimicrobial, so it's something like an antibiotic. So we know it's destroying our, our microbiome. And how else is that impacting us? Well, Dr. Seneff gets into some very serious potential speculative implications. And I don't want to say, because I don't know, but I see research, I see data that says glyphosate is extremely insidious. So what I've actually also done is gone out and find a couple other experts to talk to about this stuff. And there'll be another podcast coming out very soon uh, that you guys are going to love to hear uh, that really is a great conversation around understanding the implications uh, from all broad spectrum of negative health diseases and illnesses. So Dr. Sinef and I get into which foods are most likely to contain the highest amount of glyphosates, which ones you should avoid, what are GMOs, uh, how cholesterol is affected, um, what are some measures you can take to combat glyphosate, all the things that we're looking for as far as knowledge and great knowledge is awesome, but we also want action items. So I dig deep into that with Dr. Sneff. This is a very interesting podcast, guys. It's obviously nothing to do specifically with muscle building, but if you truly want to build muscle, it's, isn't it important that you learn to optimize the way your body works, the way your digestion works? If your digestion isn't working because you have leaky gut, guess what? Your inflammation is going to be high. You're going to be more likely to have thyroid issues, more likely to have insulin resistance, more likely to have diabetes even contributing and leading to cancer, as you'll hear Dr. Seneff speak about here. So I really hope you love this episode. And if you know anyone who is proactively trying to improve their life, this is the exact episode you're going to want to send them with Dr. Stephanie Seneff. Enjoy. From your perspective, to start the podcast, um, what are the arguments that they're making from that other side? You know, what are the arguments that these people, because uh, I, I don't understand their point of view. I don't understand what they're saying. Other than, oh, there's no data that says it's bad. Is there, from your perspective, being an expert in this field or someone who's very well researched in this field, are there any points that you would say, oh, well, maybe, you know, they do have a little bit of an argument on this? Okay, so, well, I really need to defend my position because I, sure. I have a tremendous amount of evidence that it's happening. And the thing yeah. that's happening, which you need to understand, is that glyphosate is getting into proteins by mistake in place of the amino acid glycine. Oh, I, I definitely want to go there. I know there's so much evidence 
you know, against glyphosate. But my, I just can't understand for the life of me what the defense of against it is. Well, I mean, their defense against me on this issue is that they think it can't happen. They think it's, it's chemically impossible for glyphosate to be, for, for the system glyphosate. to be fooled into incorporating glyphosate into the protein. And they Got also it. say glyphosate is safe because they claim that there have been all these studies that Monsanto has shown that it's safe. Anthony Samsel has all those studies. He got it through the Freedom of Information Act. He has thousands and thousands of papers of stuff that he has poured over them. Monsanto's unpublished studies mm -hmm. that are not generally available uh, to people to, to look at, to see what's going on. And those studies are clearly showing, uh, for example, cancer, increased risk to cancer in the exposed groups. So they're very aware of this stuff. Monsanto people know that glyphosate yeah. causes cancer. In my, in my opinion, they can't possibly not know that. Um, they don't want the world to know that. <laughs> and, and I am interested in understanding the mechanism by which it causes not only cancer, but a huge list of other things. I believe that glyphosate is the main factor in the autism epidemic today, for example. I think it's the key factor. I well, think I've it's the key factor in the opioid drug epidemic. I've read a lot of your stuff um, recently in the last couple of days, and you're linking it to, it seems, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, well, let's, instead of going down that path, let's just walk down, I, I want people to understand what glyphosate is, where it came from, um, why it was created, what the original three patents were, like, those are all questions that I think people need to know as kind of a foundation before we start getting into all the... Okay, yeah, I know of, glyphosate is an incredibly fascinating molecule, it certainly right. absorbed my attention uh, for, for several years now, I'm really fascinated with this molecule. It, it certainly is a metal chelator, and that's how it was first discovered it was considered to be something that might be useful for cleaning metal off of pipes mm -hmm. and i suspect that's why i suspect it's contributing to the lead problem in flint michigan flint michigan is surrounded by gmo roundup ready sugar beets that are where roundup is used extensively i think it's getting into their water supply and stripping the lead off of oh, those wow. lead pipes and making that lead situation much worse there than it would otherwise be. That's just one example of something it can do. Uh, it's also uh, been shown, Monsanto claims that the way that it kills the plants, the weeds, it kills all plants, except for those few that have been engineered to resist it by this special, inserting this special microbial gene that, um, that produces a version of the protein that's not sensitive to the, to the poison. And right. glyphosate kills these plants by disrupting a pathway called the shikimate pathway. And the shikimate pathway has an enzyme called EPSP synthase, and um, it, it exists in the plants, but it also exists in a lot of microbes. And many of those microbes are really important in our gut. And so glyphosate ends up killing off beneficial bacteria that depend on that pathway mm -hmm. to produce aromatic amino acids. And those aromatic amino acids are, are part of the proteins in our body as well as in the, in the microbes. And so those microbes are producing those aromatic amino acids in our gut not only for themselves, but also for us. And so that's part of how we get disrupted. Uh, we get poisoned by glyphosate in part through its, it may be in large part, I'm not sure, but certainly in part through its disruption of the gut microbiome, uh, killing, preferentially killing off the beneficial bacteria and allow, allowing species like Clostridia to overgrow, causing uh, inflammatory gut, leaky gut, all these kinds of gut problems that we see today, for example, among the autistic kids, but many other people are suffering from gut issues that I think are connected to glyphosate disrupting the balance of the gut microbiome through this, this pathway, the same pathway that it disrupts in the plants. So there's sort of two ways that you could expect it to cause trouble in humans, which is one through chelating these minerals. It chelates a, a lot of important um, cations like uh, manganese and magnesium and so copper. So it's doing that in our body? In our, or just in our body, in yeah. So it grabs bodies. hold of those metals and that makes them unavailable, for example, to the gut microbes. Uh, right. there's a I saw that with manganese. Lactobacillus critically depends on manganese. It's an unusual microbe that way. And when the glyphosate hangs on to the manganese, then lactobacillus becomes deficient. And that's part of the mechanism by which it can cause trouble for lactobacillus. In fact, that enzyme also depends on manganese, the enzyme that gets disrupted by glyphosate. Fascinating stuff. Um, so, so why is it that... Um, these crops keep popping up like the wheat, the corn, uh, the soy uh, as kind of the predominant um, culprits in this whole uh, GMO and uh, glyphosate conversation. Are those the ones that are getting the most modification because they're so prevalent? Well, they're all, and so the corn, the soy, the canola, the sugar beets, those are all GMO Roundup Ready crops. They're using glyphosate to kill the weeds. Uh, the wheat is not a GMO Roundup Ready but it's used as a desiccant right before harvest for the wheat, also for sugarcane, also for uh, legumes like uh, chickpeas and um, garbanzo beans and lentils. 
Those are testing actually with the highest levels of glyphosate and tests that have been done by the Canadian government. They're seeing incredibly high levels of glyphosate in some of these products that are derived from these legumes. And um, a lot of people, when they get gluten intolerance, they switch over to eating more of these other foods that are actually even higher, even have higher exposure to glyphosate than they had with the wheat. So you can sort of end up out of the frying pan into the fire if you start switching over to these sources of protein that are, um, that are heavily laden with glyphosate because of spraying right before the harvest. So there's sort of two ways, uh, two ways to get it from the food. One is because they're spraying the crop to kill it right before harvest as a desiccant. And the other is because they're using it to control the weeds, usually in the GMO Roundup Ready crops, but they can also control weeds when it's not GMO Roundup Ready. Um, for example, in the uh, grapes, it's showing up in the grapes, which is probably because of glyphosate being used on the weeds around the grape plants. In, in wines, it's showing up in, for example, all the California wines that Zen Hunica tested, they all came out positive for glyphosate. Right. So you've been able to draw a correlation between um, a number of predominant ailments and illnesses in society today and glyphosate, at least from what I've been able to read from your information. Um, can you start telling us beyond, you know, walking down, we, we've briefly discussed autism, briefly discussed gut health, and there's a number, a number of other implications that you've drawn conclusions. It's a huge list. I mean, it's actually, it surprises me that people aren't petrified by the situation we face right now. Well, because I think we you are, see, but we feel helpless, right? There's all these diseases that are going up dramatically yeah. and some serious things like pancreatic cancer and ALS, you know, Lou Gehrig's disease, Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's is actually going up exactly in step with the use of glyphosate on core crops, the same way as autism is. Perfect match, incredibly um, consistent pattern. Hey, I interrupt this podcast to bring you guys a little bit of a conversation around inflammation. As an athlete, as someone who trains, as somebody who's potentially even being exposed to glyphosate, inflammation is a strong concern for us, right? It's disrupting the cellular communication. It's disrupting our cells' ability to use the food we eat. It's disrupting our brain's ability to function and contributing to brain fog. Taking care of inflammation is important, and that starts with removing things like glyphosate that we're talking about today from your diet that extends into paying attention to your light. And one thing that I've started doing for probably the last 24 months on a consistent basis is consuming proteolytic enzymes, which is why I take every day uh, mass zymes. You guys know they've now become a uh, sponsor of the podcast. Bioptimizer is a great company owned by a good friend of mine, legitimate company providing legitimately efficacious products at work. Now, two benefits to this, right? If you're eating a lot of protein, if you're eating a high protein diet, you want to optimize digestion. That's a side benefit. That's a great benefit. Another benefit that I use it for on a day-to-day -day basis is decreasing systemic inflammation. Now, here's the key. You got to take these at different times. So if I'm trying to optimize digestion, I want to be taking this before a meal or during a meal. If I'm looking to optimize or decrease inflammation, I want to actually be taking it away from food. So I'll take out an empty stomach or between meals and I'll really allow it to take its effect and, and start breaking down those protein that may be unbroken in my digestive tract or even in my blood. Enzymes are a hugely popular way to get rid of inflammation and a very effective way to break down proteins. So I hope you guys take this opportunity to jump on the amazing discount offered by Bioptimizers. If you head over to the website Mass Zymes, which is linked to in the, in the show notes, masszymes.com and use the code MUSCLE, Ben 18 muscle Ben 18 you're gonna get a discount of 15% off your order right now get over there check it out you're gonna love this stuff and back to the show okay so before we move on from there like how are we drawing conclusions from from pancreatic cancer and Alzheimer's what is the mechanism the proposed mechanism is just the inflammatory pathways like oh, well I have a very interesting mechanism which is the substitution for glycine during uh, protein glycine. synthesis so you get back yeah. to that that is the key thing and that is the thing that I'm getting the enormous amount of pushback on. There's a tremendous uh, institution of denial against that idea. They're basically, mm -hmm. what the chemical industry is doing and what the chemists are doing, actually, to be frank with you, is saying it can't happen. We won't even look for it because it can't happen. They're saying it's impossible. And I am saying that the evidence is overwhelming, that it is happening. And I will start with that EPSP synthase because it's a good place to start. That enzyme that it disrupts. Uh, in the plants that famously is the reason why it kills them, that enzyme has a glycine residue, highly conserved, at the site where PEP binds. PEP is the substrate. Glyphosate's been shown to mess up the binding of PEP in that enzyme. Glyphosate is messing it up by substituting for that glycine residue within the protein. This is what I believe. 
And it makes a whole lot of sense because glyphosate has this extra stuff on its nitrogen atom that's going to get in the way of the PEP. It's not going to change the shape of the active site so the PEP no longer fits. So it makes perfect sense that that glycine could be the reason why. Substituting for that glycine during the synthesis of that protein, does that make sense to you? A lot of people seem to have trouble understanding this concept. Yeah, no, it, it absolutely makes sense. It's just blocking, you know, for, from my understanding is blocking a receptor site you know yeah because it's, be- it, but it's embedded in the protein what they're saying what monsanto people will say in the papers that they've written is that it's substituting as substrate in place of pep as a separate molecule that's in that binding site what i'm saying is that it's actually embedded in the epsp synthase protein it's part of the protein and it's sticking out into the site where the pep should be that piece of it that's the extra methylphosphonyl group is sticking out into that site and preventing pep from fitting it's very different. It's embedded inside the protein itself right. rather than hanging loose as a separate substrate, competitive so, substrate. Understood. So we've shown this in uh, plants exclusively, nothing in animals or humans? Well, here's the thing. There's like multiple species of microbes and multiple species of plants that have acquired resistance to glyphosate. Uh, and that's the basis of the GMO Roundup Ready crops. They found a, a microbe that changed that enzyme so that it was no longer sensitive to glyphosate. And the way that change was done is to get rid of that glycine residue and replace it with alanine. Multiple species of plants and multiple species of microbes have independently discovered that if they get rid of that glycine residue, they're no longer sensitive to glyphosate. This to me is incredibly overwhelming evidence that it's happening, that it's substituting for that glycine. That's how it's doing its damage. Has anyone done any research on this? No, no one. I mean, they they just deny that it's possible and therefore they don't look for it. I'm trying very hard to get chemists interested in this problem. I'm not a chemist. I don't have a lab. But uh, I certainly have some ideas for how some things you could do uh, to verify whether, why, you know, if this is happening. And in fact, Monsanto researchers themselves have done something, uh, a very strong experiment that supports this concept. And uh, this ex- experiment was done in, I think, 1989. And it, it's one of the papers that Anthony Samsel has. And they looked at bluegill sunfish. And they exposed them to glyphosate, uh, radio-labeled so they could trace it. They radio-labeled carbon in the glyphosate. And then they, um, they took tissue samples out of those bluegill sunfish and confirmed that there was active radio-label in the tissue, which meant that glyphosate was there. Then they tested for glyphosate in the normal test, and they found only 20% of the radio-label could be accounted for as glyphosate. 80% was a mystery. Because the glyphosate, it, there's not much that breaks down glyphosate, but only 20% was glyphosate. What is the rest of it? 80% was a mystery. So then they got the brilliant idea of adding enzymes that break down proteins into individual amino acids. They applied those enzymes, and then they got up to 70% yield. So they gained an extra 50% of those glycine molecules. Suddenly they could see them because they had been separated out from the, from the protein chain. So they even said in that article, they proposed perhaps the glyphosate was being incorporated into the protein. This is their words. And this is what I'm saying. This is Monsanto's Monsanto's research? Monsanto researchers, they said perhaps it was getting incorporated into the protein. Their words, not mine. And this is what I believe. It's getting substituted for glycine because it's a complete glycine molecule. It looks just like glycine. Mm -hmm. And the machinery that's trying to put a glycine there gets confused and pulls in this glycine molecule that happens to have some extra stuff on its nitrogen atom, but machinery doesn't notice that. It's still okay to put it in. And do you think the scientists are not wanting to do it because they don't believe it's true or because they think they're getting a lot of pushback from Bayer and Monsanto? I think it's both. I mean, I think the, the chemists are probably terrified. If they did the experiment and proved that it was true, they would probably uh, have, you know, Monsanto would make sure that their career got destroyed, I would suspect. I mean, Monsanto it can be really hard on people when they step out of line. Uh, I don't know. And of course, I think they may also believe that it's impossible because they're being told that. I think there's a concerted effort to make sure that people believe it can't happen so that they won't try it. You, you don't want to do an experiment that's going to fail. Right. You know. And so people are willing to believe that it can't happen for some reason that I don't understand. But I think there's been tremendous pressure to make sure that you don't go there because it's such a, it's a showstopper for glyphosate. If it does this, it suddenly explains how it can cause Alzheimer's, how it can cause autism, how it can cause pancreatic cancer, how it can cause non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. All of it becomes very clear once you say it can substitute for glycine during protein synthesis. 
You also have a very interesting theory around um, cholesterol. Yes. Can you tell me about that? Oh, <laughs> well, that's a, that's a long story, but certainly I think cholesterol is a wonderful molecule and I think it's extremely good for you in your food. You should be eating foods that are high in cholesterol. Um, I don't think it's the cause of heart disease. You know, people are taking statin drugs to lower their cholesterol because they think that it's bad for them, the cholesterol that's in their blood. I believe that cholesterol sulfate is an incredibly important molecule that um, transports both cholesterol and sulfate and is normally produced in the skin in response to sunlight, and that the enzyme that produces cholesterol sulfate is disrupted by glyphosate because of its glycine dependencies, such that it doesn't work. And as a consequence, you get a cholesterol sulfate deficiency problem, which results in a, a need to transport cholesterol inside these LDL particles because you can't, sulfation allows you to transport cholesterol without packaging it up inside an LDL particle. You can just put it straight into the blood. And the cholesterol sulfate will also go into the membranes of the red blood cells and help them to repel each other so that they won't glom up and cause uh, you know, circulation problems. Mm -hmm. um, what's the enzyme that it's affecting? Uh, ENOS, yeah. endothelial nitric oxide synthase. I've written uh, okay. several papers about it. And I have uh, two papers in particular uh, arguing that cholesterol sulfate deficiency is the most uh, c important factor in heart disease. It's a deficiency problem of cholesterol sulfate, which results okay. in de uh, a deficient supply of both cholesterol and sulfate to the heart, as well as to all the other or organs, but the heart uh, critically depends upon those nutrients to stay healthy. Fascinating. Um, and, you know, that we could go down a rabbit hole there, like any, uh, you know, short of removing glyphosate from your life and your diet, are there any intervention strategies you've recommended? Yeah, certainly removing dark glyphosate, which is, of course, impossible to one. do. It um, seems that way. Yeah. It's everywhere. It's in the water. It's in the food. It's in the air. Um, it's pretty impossible to get rid of it. Certainly going organic is crucial as a way to help reduce your glyphosate load. Um, there's a, a Cetobacter is among the very few microbes that can break that CP bond. That's a difficult bond that glyphosate has. Sorry, repeat that one more time. It's called what? Glyphosate has a bond called a CP bond, carbon phosphorus. Yep. Carbon phosphorus stuck together is very unusual in biology and very difficult to break. Most, most animals don't know how to deal with that, which is why it's hard to break down. But Acetobacter are among the very few species that can break that bond which means they can use glyphosate as a source of phosphorus, for example. Acetobacter are able to metabolize glyphosate and clear it, and therefore they're, they're good for you because if you can get acetobacter uh, flourishing in your gut, then that can help to break down the glyphosate that you're exposed to. They're present in a lot of fermented foods like uh, um, sauerkraut and apple cider vinegar and uh, kim kombucha, kimchi, all these fermented products are very... Um, useful, I suspect, for metabolizing glyphosate. And there's another thing that's been recommended, um, fulvic acid and humic acid, which are organic matter from the soil, mm -hmm. are, have been shown to uh, help cows. There was an experiment done on cows that were sick, that were, they showed they had glyphosate in their urine, and they fed them fulvic acid, humic acid, and uh, sauerkraut juice, actually, that's the acetobacter. And they were able to show uh, in lower levels of glyphosate in the urine and also improved health as a consequence of this treatment. Very fascinating. Now, one more thing that is very, very relevant to my demographic is um, the insidious nature of glyphosate on the, micro, on the uh, mitochondria. Yes, well, glyphosate is certainly uh, troublesome for the mitochondria. And glyphosate has been shown in multiple studies. Uh, to cause DNA damage. There's lots of studies, and certainly in vitro studies that have shown that specifically, and even studies on humans that are exposed in uh, areas in South Africa, not in South Africa, areas in South America where, um, where they have GMO Roundup Ready crops and the people living in these villages that are highly exposed. They have sh people have shown that they have DNA damage uh, due to the exposure to glyphosate. Of course, DNA is present in the mitochondria and the mitochondrial DNA is more sensitive to damage than the nuclear DNA. And so um, the mitochondria also produce superoxide. They produce um, oxidizing agents. And there's an enzyme, cytochrome C oxidase, in the mitochondria that depends critically on a glycine residue in order to, uh, to bring in the oxygen molecule that it needs to do its job. So that oxygen binding site uh, gets disrupted if that glycine were to get substituted by glyphosate. And I suspect that's one way in which 
glyphosate is causing a lot of trouble to the mitochondria because cytochrome C oxidase is an extremely important enzyme in the mitochondria dealing with oxygen that's going to cause uh, superoxide release and, uh, and then oxidative damage because of the disruption of that enzyme by glyphosate. So short of that theory, nobody's been able to prove the mechanism of DNA disruption by glyphosate because we've, we've shown that it is true, right? There's some data on that, but yes. so there's no proposed mechanism other than the glycine substitution? Well, so no one's proposing that except me, of course. So, I mean, right. Anthony Samsel and I, we're kind of very yeah. alone in this, in this uh, view. Um, if you do say that it's happening, then it explains all these things that they're observing. Um, glyphosate, for example, also uh, upregulates the production of glutathione in the liver. It causes an increase in the synthesis of glutathione, mm -hmm. and it causes an, in an increase in the synthesis of something called GGT, gamma glutamyl transpeptidase, which breaks down glutathione. So this, it's increasing both the synthesis of glutathione and the breakdown of glutathione. And the reason for that, I believe, is because it's incorporating itself into glutathione. Glutathione has three amino acids. Glycine, glutamate, and cysteine. The glycine is getting substituted by glyphosate, I suspect, and messing up the glutathione such that it then has to be broken down and made again, which is why it increases both the synthesis and the destruction of glutathione. And there's a study on the rhizosphere, which is these bacteria that grow in the, along the roots of the plants. And that study showed that glyphosate, it, it looked at a massive you know, analysis of protein expression and it found that one of the things it found was that glyphosate increased the synthesis of proteins that are involved in protein synthesis and synthesis of proteins that are involved in protein degradation. Again, just like glutathione, proteins in general, making proteins and unmaking them, taking them apart, both of those went up in the context of glyphosate exposure. That's because glyphosate is pr producing wayward proteins that are misfolding, that have to be taken apart and reassembled. It's at the much grander level. It's the same thing as what's going on with glutathione. So as I told you before we started the call, I had a lot of um, pushback when I made a post about around, around this, uh, just around the recent Bayer Monsanto, um, you know, multi-billion dollar payout for, um, you know, cancer causing properties. Um, tons of people were, were refuting the reality that glyphosate had any insidious nature, had any negative repercussions whatsoever. Um, what are the most prevalent uh, research papers that come to mind that I could link to in the show notes for people to, to point to some, you know, if any conclusive evidence or at least um, causative or correlative evidence suggesting that glyphosate is indeed uh, this insidious uh, product that we all believe it is. I mean, there's a lot of papers that are showing uh, specific damages caused by glyphosate, even at levels that are below, that are supposed to be safe. There's a brand new paper actually just came out, and I can give you a link to that one. Uh, be great. Quite an interesting study where they looked at human uh, immune cells, human white blood cells in vitro, and they exposed them to relatively low levels of glyphosate. Actually, all the levels they used were below the uh, uh, acceptable daily allowance according to the you know regulators so they were all sort Whatever of supposed is, right? to be safe and they showed that pretty all the levels except the very lowest one they tried uh introduced uh, dna damage they have very specific ways they can detect that it is mm -hmm. it is causing dna damage and i know how it's doing that i've actually written about it in a paper that's not published i mean it's published on the web at, on green med info this is sayer g has this site called green med info that i really like and he's published an article that i wrote called Genetically Modified Children, which is about a, 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 a documentary. It's related to a documentary with the same name. And that documentary is available. You can watch it. Um, you, know, you, can, you can buy it. And they, that documentary studied children in an area, a small town, surrounded by GMO Roundup-ready tobacco fields. And the kids in this town were showing up with extremely rare genetic disorders, as well as a very high rate of cancer. And the proposal in the documentary was that glyphosate was causing this, these problems in these children. And um, so I looked into, uh, again, the, DN the concept, if glyphosate is getting into proteins by mistake, could it cause these kinds of things? And in the process of studying the, the pro what was happening to the kids, I also looked at non-Hodgkin's lymphoma because that's the condition that Dwayne Johnson had that caused this lawsuit, which ended up you know, giving him a, 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 the jury 
uh, found in his favor and gave him a large reward. Um, right now it's down to 78 million, but it was originally $289 million um, reward for um, damages. Uh, you know about all of this, right? This California mm -hmm. lawsuit. Um, yep. So between that California lawsuit and those children, that so yeah, I'd love for you to tell us about it, but you know, you could finish your, your children conference because I'm sure our audience may not know about that lawsuit. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, that was a great lawsuit. It was a jury trial and the jury was very, very responsible. And I was absolutely blown away by the result because 289 million, uh, it was just way more than I was ever. I didn't even think they would win because usually Monsanto does such a good job of fighting back. And of course, Monsanto mm -hmm. makes sure that uh, it's very, very difficult to publish papers uh, showing glyphosate's damage because Monsanto has protected that that molecule so well. And so, but there are enough papers out there, and, and, the, and the jury was present. The evidence was presented to the jury about all these studies that were done uh, on animal studies that were showing again DNA damage is a very clear one. You don't necessarily prove tumors. But DNA damage is where you start. That's how you end up with a tumor. Eventually, you get some mutations that right. cause those cells to misbehave in ways that they just start reproducing themselves like crazy, and you've got a cancer. So to show that it's damaging the DNA is a very good step towards showing that it can cause cancer. And, um, and that's become very clear, both, as I said, in people, people who live in these areas in, in Argentina where they have a lot of exposure to glyphosate, they are showing DNA damage in their DNA. And these children in particular were showing cancer, high rates of cancer, and high rates of uh, very unusual uh, genetic mutations that were causing major disorders uh, in the children, um, you know, severe disabilities in those children in that, in that area. And uh, it was very fascinating for me to look into uh, how glyphosate could cause this in terms of the glycine substitutions, because you can find all kinds of articles about specific glycine residues in specific proteins that are very important for that protein to work properly. And I could find an entire explanation uh, based on glyphosate causing sort of a, what was called a hyperphosphorylation cascade where things are getting phosphorylated, which is causing them to be activated. And two proteins in particular that I zeroed in on, one called activation induced deaminase and one called uh, nucleoprotein 98. Those two proteins, very critical, when they get phosphorylated, you end up getting a DNA damage. And I, I can work all that out. And I've been, you know, I want to write this up and get it published, but I, it's going to be very difficult, I think, to get that published. But that gives you a direct path to both a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and the genetic mutations in the germline that's leading to severe disabilities in the children. Both of them are a result of this hyperphosphorylation cascade that's basically due to excessive phosphorylation and suppressed... Uh, the enzymes that take the phosphates off get to, get suppressed, and the enzymes that put the phosphates on get activated. Anthony and Samson and I actually talked about that in our first in the first paper we wrote on the glycine analog idea. That's our glyph glyphosate five. Our glyphosate five paper is the first one we wrote on the idea of glyphosate substituting for glycine, and we talked about excessive phosphorylation and impaired dephosphorylation, which leads to hyperphosphorylated proteins which then it turns out can lead to this cascade that causes non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. I've worked all that out. I'm quite excited about what I'm finding. So that was my next question. Like you've got this incredible um, intellectual pedigree of electrical engineering and artificial intelligence and, and you know, a uh, staff member at MIT. Are you shifting all of your focus now into effectively trying to um, weed through, you know, pun intended, all of this data and actually get yourself to some conclusive um, evidence against glyphosate? Absolutely. I've become obsessed. I mean, I have to admit, I've become absolutely obsessed with this molecule because it is so clear to me, um, this mechanism, and I'm delighted with it because I see all these correlations and I'm desperate to figure out what's causing the autism epidemic because I think that is just going to be a complete, it's going to derail our entire society. I can see a, a complete catastrophe coming because we already have so many, uh, the schools are being very burdened with all these children, not just autism, of course, ADHD, food allergies, autoimmune diseases, you know, all these problems that we face. The next generation is very sick right now. Over 50% of them have some kind of um, chronic disease that's quite serious. It's just really sad to see all these children getting so sick. And they're going to grow up and they're going to still be sick. And our society is just going to be, we're already facing a crisis with healthcare. We can't afford 
healthcare for preconditions. Well, these people who have preconditions probably have glyphosate poisoning, a lot of them or have their preconditions because of glyphosate poisoning. And you look at things like the opioid drug epidemic, we hear so much about the drug companies and blaming them for handing out these opioid drugs like candy and causing all these addictions. But these people are in pain, they need help. And the doctor is just trying to ease their pain. Why are they in pain? Because they've got glyphosate in their Mm -hmm. collagen. Collagen is the most common protein in the body. 25% of the body's proteins are collagen molecules. Collagen contains 25% of the amino acids in collagen are glycines. So collagen gets hit really hard by glyphosate and it disrupts the triple helix structure of the collagen molecule, which results in um, uh, collagen not working properly in its tensile strength and its elasticity and its ability to hold water. All these things don't work and your joints start grinding joint against joint. You lose all your cartilage and you get very, very, a great deal of pain. And then guess what? You have to buy Bears, uh, you know, Celebrex or whatever the hell they sell for I know. arthritis. And, it's and perfect. <laughs> it's terrific. You re- they're really feeding the, the, you know, the chemical industry and the pharmaceutical industry are the same thing at this point. And the glyphosate is making everybody so sick that they can make a killing selling all these drugs that are trying to, you know, so patch the problem. You're not fixing the problem. You're just patching it up. And right. they're making money left and right. Mean, it's fascinating to me that Bayer would be so audacious to come out and, and uh, purchase Monsanto, like knowing that intelligent people like you are going to go, wait a minute, they're causing the problem, they're solving the problem, there's something wrong here, there's got to be someone regulating against this, this I doesn't know. make sense. It's so incredible, isn't it? It's just, we live in a very sick society, and if we don't fix this soon, we're going to be over. I mean, I really think humans are at risk of becoming extinct, I really think so. Um, I completely, and it sounds you know, um, maybe far-fetched when there's 8 billion people on the planet, but it's really going to be a relatively fast thing, I think. I I know, and and glyphosate disrupts reproduction for sure, and we have a huge problem with uh, infertility these days in the United States, in Europe, in in, uh, China. A lot of uh, countries are are getting down below replacing yourselves, you know. We're getting our reproductive rate is going below too. Once that happens, you you know, it just takes a matter of time before humans disappear. Do we know the mechanism on that? Is it the cholesterol pathway as well? or is it well, It's a whole different pathway, but it has to do oh. with uh, disrupting the sperm. I mean, the sperm get hit really yeah. hard by glyphosate. Um, and, and the cholesterol is part of the issue there too, because the sperm really depend upon cholesterol. Cholesterol is very, very important for reproduction. So there's, I think, a cholesterol deficiency problem there. But also I mentioned disrupting the genes. You know, the, the, the germline is extremely sensitive to glyphosate uh, disruption, which is going to disrupt the DNA in the germline, and that's actually, the germline of the fetus is the, is the next generation. The fetus's children are getting disrupted if the fetus is exposed in utero. It's really interesting. You're going to affect the grandchildren of the person who's pregnant. So that was a question I wanted to ask you. Like, is there any evidence for the epigenetic expression um, cross-generationally? Absolutely. And what's happening is glyphosate is uh, causing hypomethylation of the DNA. And that's part of the process with this phosphorylation cascade that happens. This I mentioned this protein activation-induced deaminase called AID. It actually strips off the, the methyl groups. It causes the DNA to be hypomethylated, which is going to definitely disrupt reproduction. So at risk of sounding like it's all about, you know, scare tactics at this point, um, do we have any known defense mechanism, you know, short of moving to the North Pole or something? Yeah, I know. That's uh, sort of what I'm thinking. There's very <laughs> few places. I've heard Bhutan, B-H-U-T-A-N, is a country that is yeah. actually organic. So um, I'm thinking we should all move to Bhutan <laughs> because… Yeah, I mean… You know, so for me, I spend a lot of my time in Canada, a lot of my time in the U.S. And the difference from Canada to the U.S. is actually massive uh, as far as my, my um, you know, subjective feeling of how I feel when I eat food in the U.S. Is, seems like there's, it's got much more of a toxic nature. Mm, interesting. And I, don't, I don't want – yeah, it's very interesting. So, you know, the, the meat and everything like that, there's – it seems like it's much worse. So I wonder if we found a place that had maybe a little lower, um, you know, measured rates of glyphosate that we could actually – Uh, potentially start moving the whole population of the world over there. I know. um, I mean, I think we need to get more and more countries interested in banning glyphosate. And I, you know, I I give a lot of tribute to Sri Lanka and El Salvador, both of whom have banned glyphosate. Um, Unfortunately, Sri Lanka has just recently undone their ban, which is really unfortunate. 
Oh. Both of those countries have epidemics of kidney failure among agricultural workers, and they're suspecting that glyphosate is causing that. And I'm pretty much certain that that's the case. I, I've done a lot of yeah. studying on how glyphosate disrupts specific proteins with specific glycine dependencies uh, that can cause the symptoms of these unusual forms of kidney disease that we're seeing in these agricultural workers. Yeah, and I saw your work on that too, and that was super interesting. And, and you know, the irony of it—you see these weed killers that you know m make their way around the neighborhood to you know kill weeds and make the, the grass really nice, and they're literally dressed in full hazmat suits with gas masks. But this stuff isn't dangerous at all. It must be good for you, right? I like know it, it very much <laughs> upsets me that a pregnant woman can go down to the local hardware store and buy some uh, Roundup and apply it to dandelions in her yard, breathe that air as she's doing that. She might think it's not toxic, so she's not really being at all careful about it. And she could end up with an autistic child because of that, you know? So interesting. Um, a few more questions. Like, is there anything we can do? Is there anybody who's actually taking a stand against this? Is, is there anybody, you know, like, if, not that we want us to go out and protest Monsanto, but like, uh, you know, short of buying organic, I'm sure that's step one. Like, let's start speaking with our dollars. Is there any organizations that you know of that are, you know, actively... Um, trying to do something in the way of outlawing glyphosate in well, North America. Well, do you know as Anne Honeycutt, Moms mm -hmm. Across America? Have you heard of her? I do. Yeah, because no. she's she's a uh, she's great. She's a mother of, of three three sons, and um, she had issues with her children. Her children had you know health issues. They had uh, allergies, and one of them was even diagnosed with a looked like he might have autism. And she completely fixed their health by re by converting the family to an organic diet. And then she became very passionate about it, and she started an organization called Moms Across America. And so she's been sort of a, a real advocate um, for organic food and uh, trying to get the message out about the harmful nature of glyphosate. She's done a good job of testing various things. She tested, as I said, a bunch of California wines and found glyphosate in all of them. She recently tested water in the waterways of Florida um, because she, I told her I suspected glyphosate was a major player in the um, – red tide problems that Florida has had this year, really bad problems with the red tide. And the uh, cyanobacteria are the blue-green algae that um, are also overgrowing in the Florida waterways. Those are one, one of the few microbes that can metabolize glyphosate. Just like Acetobacter, they are able to completely metabolize glyphosate. So they get an edge when there's a lot of glyphosate in the water, the cyanobacteria flourish. And then the cyanobacteria actually feed the red tide algae. So that whole system becomes out of control. And they're having massive uh, die-offs of uh, marine life in Florida. And the, the beaches are disgusting. Glyphosate's yep. a major player there. Glyphosate's used on the sugarcane crops as a desiccant right before mm -hmm. harvest around Lake Okeechobee. Glyphosate was even used directly in the waterways to control mm -hmm. some of the weeds that were growing there. And, of course, glyphosate is used to beautify all those lawns mm -hmm. in those millionaires' homes. So there's a lot of glyphosate going on in Florida that I think is causing this uh, epidemic in the red tide, the red tide situation uh, there. And she tested water and found as much higher levels of glyphosate uh, in that water. She has an article about that very recently. She's posted on her website about the, um, the glyphosate in the water, uh, waterways of Florida. If we stopped, um, if we outlawed glyphosate tomorrow, how long would you predict that it took us to get it out of our food supply, our water supply, our soil? How yeah, long, it's an excellent ideas? question, and I don't really have a good answer. Um, Monsanto has claimed that it disappears very quickly, that it gets metabolized within two weeks when you use it on the soil, you know, in the soil. But that claim has been shown not to be true. Uh, people have found that it can survive up to a year, for example, in the ocean, and it can survive even for multiple years in certain kinds of uh, soil. So it depends upon the soil. It depends on whether those microbes are available that can break it down because you really need those microbes. The sunlight, um, you know, UV rays, light can, can break it down, but that's a slow process. So uh, I think it sticks around for quite a long time. And of course, it's also, there's a memory of it that's sticking around in our epigenetics. So mm. even if it disappeared entirely, you would still have the ramifications of it showing up in multiple succeeding generations because of the effect that it had on the genome in some grandparent or great-grandparent population. Do you believe there's any such thing as organic right now because of you know, obviously <laughs> this this drift of, of glyphosate that happens? It's very sad. I think yeah, it's true that even organic products are testing positive for glyphosate, um, especially if they're from the U.S. Uh, it's very interesting. There was a study done. Well, there's a friend of mine, Tony Mitra, who's a fantastic activist from Canada. He's a he's Indian descent, 
he's in India right now and he's making a big splash there because he's made them aware of the fact that they are buying legumes from Canada that are loaded with glyphosate. And the Indian government is actually getting quite upset. Various counties that he's been presenting this data to that he's had a lot of traction. He got the Canadian government to test over 8,000 samples of foods for glyphosate. Uh, U.S. government has been completely uh, negligent. They have t tested only soy and they tested soy in 2011, only one year. They found it in it found either glyphosate or AMPA in 96% of the soy samples that they tested. It was 300 samples. So it's all over the soy. Um, and of course, the U.S. government concluded that that's not a problem because glyphosate is completely safe, so we don't care. And they're not testing anything else, despite the fact that glyphosate is the most used chemical in agriculture, you know, the most used uh, herbicide by far. They don't bother to test it because it's perfectly safe. But the Canadian government did test it, and they found it in all kinds of foods. And they particularly found high levels in, they looked at Canadian foods as well as imports, and they found high levels in, from Canada, high levels from the U.S., much, much lower levels in products that were imported from Europe, and surprisingly, much, much lower levels in products imported from Mexico. The Mexican mm. uh, foods came out more like the European foods. So one thing to do if you can't afford organic is to buy it from Mexico, buy your tomatoes from Mexico. You know, when you see it, something made in Mexico, it's probably safer than something from the U.S. or Canada. See, that's fascinating because you go to the grocery and, you know, 80% of the, the organic food is from Mexico. And I'm always like, gosh, you can't even drink the water in Mexico. I Why know. Would I we have this produce? concept that Mexican food is not safe. And yet it's actually they're doing a better job than we are. A much better job, actually, with respect to glyphosate. Very, very interesting. Um, what are you doing to protect yourself? <laughs> like, if anything, I, you know, you mentioned uh, Acetobacter, and that's really interesting. I'll look into that. I don't know if yes. anybody's like packaging that and, su and selling it as a supplement, we but you do. may want to put well, a patent on it quickly. What we do quickly. is we have a, a apple cider vinegar. We make our own um, organic uh, salad dressing, and we yeah. have a salad before dinner. So that way we're getting the apple cider vinegar before you start eating whatever foods might be contaminated with glyphosate. You have a head start there. So I, we, we, we like to um, to eat apple cider vinegar. Is and, that the primary one? And, and then maybe um, kombucha? Yeah, kombucha is good too. Um, certainly if you like kombucha, kombucha is kind of a developed taste, I think. But um, yeah, it's good. Yeah. Whether um, we like it or not, if it's going to make us no, clear no. this stuff, I mean, we're going to eat it, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I also like Epsom salt baths. This is for the sulfate because oh. I think sulfate deficiency, I guess I haven't said much about it. I mentioned the cholesterol sulfate, but there's yeah. a systemic sulfate problem. Uh, associated with glyphosate exposure, uh, critical enzymes involved in, in managing sulfate are disrupted, I suspect, through glycine substitution. For example, sulfotransferase has a dependency on a, a motif that has two highly conserved glycines in it. And if that if those aren't glycine, that molecule doesn't work. And sulfotransferase is what moves sulfate around from, you know, puts a sulfate onto things such as making cholesterol sulfate. And that enzyme, I mentioned enos as well, these enzymes get disrupted. There's many, many enzymes involved in sulfur and sulfate in particular that are disrupted if glyphosate substitutes for glycine during protein synthesis. And I'm seeing, uh, certainly the autistic kids have a severe sulfate deficiency problem, and they also have a methylation deficiency problem. Both of those come from methionine, and studies have shown that glyphosate uh, disrupts the synthesis of methionine by uh, microbes. So it, it's, it's interfering with the... With the um, enzymes that produce methionine uh, from, from sulfur. And methionine is a critical source of both methylation and sulfation pathways. Right. Yeah. So you brought both of those up during the conversation, and it's great that you brought it back up again. It, so is there then benefit in obviously eating high sulfur-rich foods and perhaps methyl, uh, methylation support through supplementation? Yeah. So I certainly believe in high sulfur-containing foods, and we eat tons and tons of garlic and onions in my family. And also a grass-fed beef, which is maybe problematic, I'm hearing, because grass, you're not guaranteed the grass isn't um, alfalfa, or GMO right. Roundup Ready alfalfa. So that's very worrisome, because I think healthy beef is a very good source of a lot of things. Cholesterol is one of them, and also sulfur. Uh, generally, I like uh, organic eggs are a really good idea because they have a tremendous amount of nutrition in them, including the sulfur and the cholesterol and, and healthy fats. I, a high fat uh, diet and a high saturated fats and even animal fats, we actually use lard for cooking, organic lard in my family. Mm -hmm. um, and I highly recommend that. Butter is also very, very nutritious, organic butter. So mm -hmm. High fat, high cholesterol, high sulfur is, is what I like of uh, cheese also. I eat a lot of organic cheese, especially I like sharp cheddar cheese and brie, um, organic cheese. That's another way to get uh, microbes as well. So getting fermented foods 
Um, Great. I was going to ask you that, like knowing what you know about glyphosate, are you doing what you can to avoid eating excessive amounts of vegetables? You know, we talk to some vegans sometimes and we're like, well, what about this? You know, like we know, I, again, I don't know if, if the prevalence of glyphosate is higher in animals than it is in. Uh, I know. In, in, That's a good like, question. So it could be very, very dangerous in animals because of it getting into collagen, for example. Right. Uh, collagen has tons of glycine residues, as I mentioned, and uh, animal uh, meats contain a lot of collagen. And if the collagen doesn't get broken down because of the enzyme problem, then the collagen can become auto uh, an autoimmune disease. You can end up attacking your own collagen with your antibodies that you're producing against the collagen that you ate that couldn't be broken down because it was contaminated with glyphosate. So that can be a really nasty situation, which can again cause joint problems. We have such an epidemic in people uh, as they age, they get uh, so uh, in so much pain with osteoarthritis and things like that. And I think it's because glyphosate is disrupting the prote the uh, the proteins that that make the joints healthy. So you get bone on bone because all that collagen disappears um, due to um, its disruption by glyphosate. Fascinating stuff. Now, this is probably out of your wheelhouse, but I'm curious if you're using a specific water filter to make sure it's not in your water. I should be. And I've been thinking about getting a reverse osmosis filter. I have heard that that's the only one that works against glyphosate. Um, and it takes out everything. It takes out all the minerals. So you have to put the minerals back in. So it's quite a pain. And I mean, it's a shame because natural water is very, very healthy and water has things in it that are very important for your health. And in fact, if you live in a place where there's a lot of sulfur in the soil, places like Crete and Iceland have a lot of basalt rock, which has a lot of sulfur in it. And that becomes sulfur in the water that actually becomes a very important nutrient. Those people who live there have uh, improved health and longer life, uh, I think because of the sulfur they're getting from their water. But if you do this reverse osmosis, you take it all out. So it's very frustrating to me that you have to take out all the good stuff in order to get rid of the glyphosate. I do feel that I, I, I have homes in places that where I feel the water is really healthy water in the sense of being well protected, but I, I suspect it's still contaminated because it comes in from the rain and you can't avoid it. A lot of the people who are very health conscious are very aware of the excretion of toxins, right? We're all taking, we're all doing saunas, we're all exercising often, we're drinking high amounts of water, taking high amounts of fiber. Is that in any way going to benefit us when it comes to glyphosate because of it being embedded in the proteins or is that just completely a waste of time as far as glyphosate? Yeah, I don't know how to get glyphosate out of the proteins other than, again, the sulfur because the sulfur is very important for that actually because uh, sulfate is needed by the lysosomes to be able to break down cellular debris. And a lot of the cellular debris is misfolded proteins. This is what you get with Alzheimer's disease. That's actually interesting with the Alzheimer's, the amyloid beta. They have zeroed in on a particular peptide sequence within amyloid beta that has two highly conserved glycine residues in it. And those glycines seem to be the, part, the problem that's causing amyloid beta to misfold. And those glycines are supposed to be making it turn into an alpha helix that goes into the membrane. But instead, they get turning into glyphosate, which is causing it to be water soluble and ending up as a soluble uh, protein in the cytoplasm that then forms, eventually precipitates out as fibrils when you get too many of those molecules in the cell. They, they glom together and form these fibrils that create the amyloid beta plaque. If you can clear that plaque with the lysosomes, then you can get rid of it. But you need the sulfate to be able to do that, and the sulfate's deficient because of the glyphosate's other effects on the sulfur system. So you're pretty much, you know, <laughs> caught between a rock and a hard place with respect to having these proteins that you can't break down because you don't have enough sulfate. Right. Do you think there's any benefit to supplementing with glycine um, so that there's glycine is always present maybe to compete, quote-unquote, with the glyphosate? Yeah, a lot of people have, have, have suggested that to me, and I'm aware that glycine itself can become toxic if it's yeah. too high relative to alanine because it will actually substitute for alanine during protein synthesis, which is quite interesting. It's probably not as bad a problem right. as having glyphosate substituting for glycine, but it's still a problem. So you can get glycine toxicity if you take too much, but I do think it is a good idea to... Uh, outcompete the glyphosate with excessive, making sure you get enough glycine. I would do it through high glycine foods, which um, one thing would be collagen, well, you know, that, but you'd have to have well, organic that's the unfortunate collagen. nature, right? You're like, well, I'm buying this in the store. It may be organic, but who really knows what's in it? So it's... Yeah. yeah. If you're getting glycine, you're probably getting glyphosate because I suspect the whole manufacturing process. I've been looking a lot at various patents for how they make things because I think a lot of the drugs and a lot of the supplements are probably contaminated with glyphosate Gosh. due to the manufacturing process where nobody's paying any attention to whether there might be glyphosate in the ingredients that are going into the manufacturer. Is this it an thing. expensive testing process if I want to get some stuff tested? 
Yeah, unfortunately, they have not come up with a, a cheap test for glyphosate. I would love to see someone come up with something. People are interested. I've, I've had people contact me who want to try to develop a device that you could buy or even some way that you can install something on your phone. It'd be wonderful if you could sort of zap your, as you go to the grocery store, zap the food and get a yes, no answer on whether there's glyphosate in it. It's not impossible to imagine I'm that sure, that could I'm happen I'm sure someday, Monsanto would buy it as it's quickly difficult. as could be. <laughs> buy it and close yeah. it down. It's, um, it's, it's a difficult molecule to test. And actually, as I said, you can have a false test because... Uh, and it's very interesting with, for example, milk. And I get back to Zen Honeycutt. She had several women uh, get their breast milk tested for glyphosate. And I think about a third of them came out with positive number. And the highest one was 1,600 times higher than the amount allow allowed in water in Europe. So this woman had quite high levels of glyphosate in her breast milk. Um, there was, was her in her... In, uh, study was followed up by, very quickly by some folks who did another study where they published and said, no, there's no glyphosate in milk. They looked at cow's milk, and the first thing they did was to precipitate out the proteins. And then they looked at what was left over once the proteins were removed. Well, the glyphosate is in right. the proteins, and if you don't break them down, you won't see it. So you have to both um, have protein. If you have protein, you've got to make sure you keep it there, and you've got to break it down. And Anthony Samsel has been developing methods for um, you know, uh, breaking down the protein through hydrochloric acid and through um, enzyme action to make sure that you break it down into individual amino acids before you test because you won't see the glyphosate if it's embedded in the protein. All right, so our takeaways today, eat organic only. Make sure you- Sulfur, eat sulfur. lots of sulfur. Oh, get sunlight. I didn't mention that, but sunlight exposure. I mentioned it because I talked about the cholesterol yep. sulfate. And the enos responds to cholesterol sulfate by producing sulfate, responds to sunlight by producing sulfate, I believe. And I've written papers about that. And so sunlight exposure is very important for producing sulfate. You can even get it from hydrogen sulfide gas, I think, that's in the air. You can turn it into sulfate uh, with sunlight. Gosh, so many takeaways. So sulfide, uh, sulfate potentially supplementing with glycine, potentially supplementing with methylation, definitely taking some apple cider vinegar before meals, potentially adding in some kimchi or some fermented foods and doing your best to move to Bhutan. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Bhutan is going to get overwhelmed exactly. with all these immigrants. <laughs> Immigration is going to be through the roof. Dr. Sneff, thank you so much for your time. Absolutely incredible. I would love to be able to support you in any way. Um, is there a way we can get into contact with you or listeners can follow you? I'm not sure if you're on social media or... Yeah, I have a Facebook page. I, I typically uh, post a lot of things okay. there, various articles that I find of interest. And I have my MIT webpage where I have, as you know, a lot of techie yep. stuff. I mean, there's papers and everything, a lot of material on my MIT webpage, which is a bit of a complicated well, name, we'll but just, it's CSAIL. Okay, okay, good. You, if you can post that, ccl.mit.edu slash center. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, that's, we'll link to uh, in the show notes. Um, so it gets an excuse to get everybody over and check out our show notes on this episode. Because honestly, this is a lot of uh, complicated info, a lot of takeaways. So it'd probably be beneficial for people to go back there and check out some of the terms and such. And such. Thank you. Join us on BenPokolsky.com to learn the cutting edge techniques to take control of your body, your brain, and create your greatest life. This podcast is for information purposes only. The statements and views on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Ben Pekulski and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. This podcast may contain paid endorsements or advertisements for products or services. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest in products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.